first, we do have one more free agent bomb that does not involve the NFC South or the Saints. It involves a uh, a friend of the program, Mr. C.J. Gardner-Johnson, who is now headed to the Lions on a, get this, one-year, $8 million contract. Um, I don't know what he was looking for in free agency, but I guarantee you it was a lot higher than that. And there are some reports out there that the Eagles offered a three-year deal and he turned that down. And his agent went on Twitter and kind of like threw that deal under the bus and said, they offered us one year, 8 million. The the Eagles offered three years, but it was really a one year, $7 million deal because the final two years and $17 million were not guaranteed. And it's like, okay, well, when you put it that way, it doesn't sound like they were giving him an honest offer. And it does kind of feel similar to how the Saints ended up with Jamal Williams, who the Lions kind of lowballed, and he was like, "No, I'm leaving." And and he talks a lot about that in our interview with him. Um, but yeah, so CJ is going to hang out with Dan Campbell and Aaron Glenn over on the Lions, and I just think it's really interesting that he can't seem to find that deal that he was so confident he deserved uh, this time last year. Yeah, I I thought he would end up in the end being retained by Philadelphia, but. They ended up moving on from him, uh, resigning some guys into their secondary, and bringing back Darius Slay. I know that they'd expected that uh, that he was going to be let go. Ended up bringing him back, uh, but it's kind of weird. A guy s- still young, obviously very productive, is now on his yeah his third team already, and we saw obviously some of the. You know, the negative parts of Gardner Johnson in the locker room on his way out when you could tell he was just out to get his money. And I don't blame him for that at all, but it seemed to spill into other things onto the field, obviously, during training camp when he was the the hold in, not even taking part, but still being there and being a distraction. Yeah, you can't question the talent. I mean, he he missed, what, five games last year and led the, still led the league in interceptions? I think it was – wasn't there a day he had back-to-back pick sixes on Jameis? I don't know if it was back-to-back, but it was his first throw <laughs> of the game. Or it was his first throw of the practice. That it was. I think it was the first throw in, like, full-team drills on a pat, and the first day of, like, full pads. And CJ, yes, took him to the house. I think he threw another pick six, but it was to somebody else. Okay, okay. But, yeah, th- there's no questioning the talent there. But it does make you wonder, you know, that I think – the Saints, by the end, were very tired of the antics um, in terms of how it was kind of impacting the locker room and kind of, I don't think that they wanted to deal with it anymore. And that was a big part of why they weren't interested in paying him. And you see, like the Eagles, you know, they made him an offer, it seems like, but it wasn't a, oh, we definitely want to keep you around. And considering they did trade for him, right? They did give up two draft picks. To and they weren't great draft picks, a fifth round this year and a sixth round next year, but they traded more than they're going to get back and for him leaving in free agency. So, you know, they they got one year out of him, and it's like, okay, so he was a rental for the Eagles. Clearly, they were no more invested in him in terms of being a long term safety answer for them than the Saints were. So, it's got to be something beyond just his play on the field because he's clearly a productive member of these defenses he's been on so it's got to be something more than that it's it's wild to me obviously limited production last year he got hurt but still uh one of i think four or five of the leaders in interceptions with six Mm -hmm. on the season that's uh, absolutely uh to his credit and you know some are going to say you know the you know the tip ball interceptions oh those are pretty easy to make but you know what there's it's still you're, you're the guy in the right place at the right time i don't care he's still um, someone who uh, just brings that noticeable presence on the field that is a is is that concern for the opposing quarterbacks, and I'm t- I know you know Tom Brady won't be around anymore for him to to get in the face of, and that that's just one of those uh, iconic moments uh, you could say in a Saints uniform wh- when everybody was all about the love of C.J. Gardner Johnson, but in Detroit you get that matchup again with Dan Campbell and Aaron Glenn. So there's still that connection with the black and gold. And it's just interesting to see that, you know, Dan Campbell, we heard talking about gnawing off kneecaps, right? So CJ Gardner-Johnson is definitely a guy that'll go out there and do that. 
Yeah, and I think there are a lot of parallels with the situation surrounding Jamal Williams, where I don't think he's necessarily an issue in the locker room, at like 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 you might think CJ is, but from from being kind of an eccentric personality, there's definitely um, you know a lot there, uh, and in the sense that Jamal led the NFL in rushing touchdowns. And a lot of people are like, oh, that's not, that doesn't matter. They're all short yardage, blah, blah, blah. He's not worth this big contract. CJ, in in the sense of he led the league in interceptions and everyone's like, yeah, but, you know, and and I think both of those guys this season, like they're, they were already chip on the shoulder guys. It's still there. It is still very much there. Um, but let's, let's move on to somebody the Saints might bring in and it's a, a familiar name and the Saints hosted Foster Morrow on a free agent visit. He's a New Orleans native. He went to Jesuit, um, obviously was at LSU, and he spent the last four years catching passes from Derek Carr. Um, and so if the Saints are looking to add one more tight end, which it seems like they probably are in the market for, um, I don't expect you to roll into the season with two tight ends. He could be a really good option uh, and a guy who's familiar with Derek Carr and can help him kind of find a like I think it's a it's helpful to have someone else learning the offense at the same time you are you know if you're switching schools it's kind of nice to have a a friend with you that was at the old school right and I think that's kind of what it might be in terms of getting comfortable in a new program but it's going to be an interesting one to watch because he's been pretty productive he hasn't been great but he has been solidly productive uh, over the last four years what's interesting too yeah he's got an opportunity to come home play with his uh former Raiders buddy as well but he also, I know, visited with the Cincinnati Bengals. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if uh, that former LSU love with Joe Burrow gets, you know, ignites more interest. Um, but I haven't seen that. What's funny is I haven't seen any other um, visits for Morrow. I don't know if he's been uh, making any other stops uh, during his free agency tour. Well, that is the annoying thing. I, I don't like to get over into like overhyped into oh so and so is visiting who and blah 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 because you only hear about some of them and right. you only hear about the ones that are notable and who knows maybe he did go visit the jets and no one reported it so it it, it is one of those things that i try not to get too deep into because otherwise you're just chasing your tail constantly um but i think that one is significant because you can see the connections and it would be a, a homecoming for him so he might have some incentive to take a maybe a lesser deal if it's on the table. Um, and like the Saints are just like, hey, we'll, we'll give you this if you want to come to New Orleans and kind of play in front of your hometown. Um, so that's that's definitely one to watch. Uh, but it's not – it's one, it's of the – all the signings in the NFC South this year, it would be bottom of the barrel in terms of, you know, impact probably. Um, so I, I think that's a good segue into some of the other moves that have been made. Yeah, for sure. The uh... – Carolina Panthers don't seem to be uh, little small, little purring kitties right now heading into this year. They're trying to like ignite that that roar again with them with some of these moves. You, you kind of laugh of after that trade of giving up so much, including the fact that gave up DJ Moore, but they did a little work to to replenish uh, the roster, especially uh, an interesting, I'll say, move at wide receiver, a guy that I know. I'm always was um, pretty annoyed at seeing when he was with the Vikings. Here, hold on. I got to let my dog outside. All right. Okay. Yeah. If I didn't, if I didn't let him out, he would just stood at the bottom of the stairs and barked for the next 20 minutes. And it would just come at like increasingly like closer intervals, you know, like he'll start and he'll bark like once every, like maybe like 45 seconds and then as time goes it'll be like once every 30 seconds and then eventually it'll be like you know once you start hearing the double barks that's when you know it's like you must get down here and then when he gets real mad he'll actually come up the stairs (laughs) but i don't want him to do that because he's like old and decrepit and hurt himself like i've been carrying like i have pretty steep like double back stairs yeah. Um. And I've had to, I've been carrying him up the stairs every night. Oh. He's like a fifty pound dog. I have to like forklift him up. <laughs> it's just and, it, and he's old, so he farts. Like it's like he like squeezes <laughs> totally the farts out. <laughs> like I'll I, like I'll pick him up and just be like. <laughs> 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 uh, 
That's love right there. Oh, God. It's a good exercise. <laughs> anyway. Oh, man. But yeah, the Panthers, they've made a bunch of moves this free agency cycle. The Panthers and the Falcons have definitely been the most active in the division, I would say. And the the one you were referencing right there, Adam Thielen, been with the Vikings for, I, I don't even know, four, seven years probably. He's been there forever. And he's going to be a security blanket for whoever starts at quarterback. And that quarterback might very well be Andy Dalton. They've also brought in Miles Sanders and Hayden Hurst. They've signed Von Bell and Shai Tuttle. And they have right now the number one overall pick in the draft. So, you know, that's a team that, while I don't expect them to be overly competitive, first year head coaches can sometimes like be, I, I think you'll see this occasionally as a first year head coach is able to motivate in a way that like a third year head coach isn't always able to like Ben McAdoo with the giants when he showed up and it was like, everyone played pretty well that first year. Cause it's just like, Oh, it's, it's fresh. It's new. You're excited. So maybe that's what the Panthers do this year. And if it is, I think, one of the ways that this season that feels like it's really kind of set up for success for the Saints, one of the ways it could go really, really badly and maybe end up in a firing of a head coach is if Andy Dalton goes up to Carolina and ends oh. up, you know, coming down here and beating the Saints and winning the NFC South as the Panthers quarterback. I think that would be a good way to really kind of hit the self-destruct button on the current regime of the Saints roster. Uh, so that's something to like, I, I don't know, like if there was a team that I feel like could really piss off saints fans this year, it's the Panthers. And, and it's because of some of the moves they've made, which I think are really kind of understated, but, but good ones. And for whatever reason, and like these rivalry games, man, Carolina is always a pain in the ass. I, I mean, the, there's been, there's been domination over like mostly Tampa and Atlanta. I feel like. Well, at least in the regular season for Tampa, we know what happened obviously in the playoffs. But with with Carolina, that I feel like the series is more even uh, than, or maybe even Carolina has the lead because, yeah, even last year both both games were were just terrible, awful, no good, horrible losses that very easily should have been victories. But the, the Carolina found a way with two different damn quarterbacks to pull it off. Yeah, the Panthers have won three of the last four. Um, the Saints won that second game to, in 2021 with Taysom Hill starting. It was a low-scoring game. Um, yeah, they've been a team that has gotten worse as the season's gone on a, a lot of the time. But yeah, it, the defense is still there. And I think when you look at yeah. what has really been a struggle for the Saints in those matchups has been the defense. It's diff going to be a different scheme this year. Who knows if it's going to be as effective Matt Rule always had this kind of college fire zone blitz scheme that just ran the Saints offensive line ragged. So maybe they'll switch from that. Maybe they'll have an easier time. I don't know. But yeah, that's the that's the team that's like I don't I don't think they've even made they haven't spent the most money, but I think they've made the best moves in terms of, you know, I feel like this is a team that could contend now and is built to to kind of to kind of climb. And I still think trading DJ Moore was a mistake. Um, but you know, if they hit on the quarterback and that quarterback is the, the next, you know, star in the NFL, then, then they, then it was the right move. So I, I would much rather be in the Panthers position right now than the Falcons position, if that makes sense. The Panthers, there's question, obviously uh, how much they gave up to move to number one. And now then the reports of, oh, there's a different beliefs on who they should take there between the coach and the owner. Who knows how much of that is true or just, you know, leading up to draft day fodder that we're hearing about kind of thing. But you better be damn sure, obviously, if you made that trade to have a clear-cut picture of who you're getting. And I don't want to hear them, oh, well, we're also willing to trade down if 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 the right package comes available kind of thing because – yeah, the, the inclusion of DJ Moore was excessive in that uh, in that trade to me, but the the addition of Thielen is interesting. I'm not saying in any any way that's going to uh, replace a guy like Moore, but definitely someone. It's a valuable possession kind of receiver that seemed to be a security blanket. I thought, like you mentioned at the at the beginning of this, 
um, for um, uh, the quarterback in Minnesota? Kirk Cousins. Thank you, Cousins, Mr. League Average. Mr. And League then average. just kind of had a down year, and they said, all right, bye, we're done with you. He's old. You know, I, I don't blame them for, for moving on. But, um, yeah, and, and we, we can kind of shift to the Falcons now because the Falcons spent the most money by far. <laughs> They had the most to spend, and they and they spent it. They signed David Onyemata, Caden Nellis, safety Jesse Bates, QB Taylor Heineke, and then they had a couple moves, right tackle Caleb McGarry, wide receiver Matt Collins. Um, I think Heineke might start <laughs> week one. I, I don't think it's a guarantee that Desmond Ritter wins that quarterback battle out of camp. Um, but either way, I'm not – I, I'm not frightened by either of them in terms of what they might do in the division. Um, but yeah, I mean, you didn't, you, you, you already have receivers. They did trade Calvin Ridley. Kyle Pitts had a really down year. He dealt with injuries. He's got to be better, but there's just, I don't see a ton on that offense that, that really scares me. And that's why when you see a team give up that kind of money for a safety, it's like, really? Uh, are you because it seems like you're tanking? It it seems like you're you're one year away, but you're signing people like you're going for it, which is just odd to me. Um, but we'll have to see how they how they kind of operate this year. It's almost like the GM Terry Fontenot said, you know what? Since we got you to come on over here, Ryan Nielsen, we're gonna go wild and spend on this defense for you. I think that no, I think that's a really good point. I think it is kind of like like they're like, we'll bring you over here and we're gonna get you who you want. Like right. we're going to make sure we get the players that put you in a position to succeed, right? Because he was in a good position with the Saints. While he might not have been a play-calling defensive coordinator, he was manning one of the better defenses in the NFL, and he wants to be a head coach, right? He, he One of the ways you can be a head coach is by going and being a defensive coordinator somewhere. One of the ways you can make sure you don't get a head coaching job is by going and leading one of the worst defenses in the NFL, uh, like with, with your first real opportunity to be the solo guy, right? So I think that is something that's going on here is they he he agreed to go there and they agreed to get him his guys. They agreed to get him Caden Nellis, David Onyemata, Jesse Bates, these guys, and they did. And so now he's got no excuses. Um, and uh, it is interesting. But, you know, moving on to the next the next and final team in the NFC South, the Bucks, who really didn't do much. Um, the one thing they did was sign somebody who probably will start instead of Kyle Trask, which I'm kind of annoyed if I'm Kyle Trask and I was going to get that chance. Um, <laughs> but they brought in Baker Mayfield, who it would be weird if he backs up Kyle Trask. Like, I get it. They, they He's been in the system, but like, it would be really, really strange if Baker couldn't beat out Kyle Trask in camp. Well, remember um, there, there was a time where I believe it was what PJ Walker was the starter and like, Baker was running like scout team for the Panthers. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, PJ has been, has played before. They've, they've <laughs> actually like, this isn't, this would be Kyle Trask's debut in the NFL. He's on two passes. Um, it, it'll, it'll be interesting. I think, I still think it's going to be a, a, you know, awful QB play in Tampa. We'll see what, what Baker does now. Uh, he, I guess he had a little bit of a revitalization there with the Rams. Um, but I'm just, I'm not a Baker believer. So we'll, uh, no. I'll be happy to root for against him with the Buccaneers now. No, they also, they cut Leonard Fournette and they brought in Chase Edmonds. This is, this very much looks like a team to me that is hoping yeah, for Cameron a great gone. Right. Another one. Yeah. Right. It, it's this, they brought, they brought back the linebackers, right? They brought back Levante David and Devin white. And to right. me, that indicates that this is a team that's hoping to have a one year rebuild. Kind of like the Colts did with Andrew Luck. Right. Um, you know, Peyton Manning got hurt. He had the neck thing. He was out the whole season. They sank all the way to the bottom, but still had a competitive roster, like the shell of a competitive roster. And then they got Andrew Luck, and then they were right back in. I think they made the playoffs the next year. And I think that's what the Bucks are trying to do here. Like they're trying to maintain guys like Devin White, Levante David, but they are set up to drop to the bottom. That might be the only reason Kyle Trask does start is because – you have a chance to move, go from Tom Brady, sink all the way to the bottom, reset your cap table, and then bring in um, Caleb, Caleb. Caleb Williams. Is that his name? Yeah. 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 And then bring him Caleb Williams. And if, and, and you know what? That's a, that's a tight needle they're trying to thread. But if you do it, 
You know, I, I can't, I can't hate on the idea, what but if they you, have to be bad. They have to be bad. They cannot be a five win team. They have to be a one win team or a two win team for that to make sense. But if they can get it done, I'm not going to fault it because that's what everyone in the NFL thinks is like the gold standard of rebuilds is be good, tank for the top pick, be good again. It doesn't, it rarely works, but in this case with that type of prospect, I think, you know, it's like there was a suck for luck. I don't know what, what what's the term you're going to have for Caleb. Uh, yeah. I can't like crashing for Caleb. I, you can't that's like that's probably a good one. Crash for Caleb clunker for K. I don't know. One eight seven seven cars for Caleb. Um, K-A-R-S cars for Caleb. But <laughs> I think, I do think that's what's happening. I really do think that's what's happening with the box and, you know, good for them. Well, what 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 happens when Baker messes around and wins you a couple games, and then like, wait a minute, what <laughs> what right. happened? To, what happened to tanking for Caleb? <laughs> exactly, and so that's why you know I said it's going to be really weird if Kyle tries to start over Caleb. Yeah. But if you are committed to the tank the way that the Bucks seem to be, then that's all the reason you need to throw Kyle Trask in there because I could see them going zero and seventeen with Kyle Trask as the starter. I think Baker is good enough that he'll back into a couple wins by accident. And that's what For they sure. want to avoid. I agree with you.